Okay, we're going to talk house rules today. House rules are one of those things that people love and it angers them. So I'm going to take that chance. And today we're going to talk about the not the top five, but my top six house rules. Okay, so um, we're going to go into those top six house rules. These are house rules or something very odd that it's pretty funny. When I do a video on here, I know we're going to get comments one way or another. And people like games or don't like games. But house rules, it's even going further down that rabbit hole. Because some people, when you do a house rule, they're like, oh, well, that's totally against the spirit of the game. Here's the thing. When you get a game, that game is for you to enjoy. And I honestly usually play most games as the rules say, because I think, you know what, the designer it really had something in mind when he created this. But then after I play it, if I find something works better for myself or my group, I will 100% deviate from that. Now, I think the biggest house rule I have is play it first the way the designer wants you to play it and see if it works for you, no matter what BGG says or whatever, because if this game was designed, it's someone's passion project, they believe in it. But again, if you have something that works for you, then do it because this game is all about you and your group enjoying it. So we're going to get some comments on these and I want to hear your house rules and if you agree or disagree and some of these games you might have other house rules for. But I didn't do top five because I had a sixth one that I wanted to add that was just fun. So anyway, these are my top six games that need house rules and what they are. Okay, so my first one is going to be almost not a house rule, but it's... um a variant, I guess, and this is one that I've become a huge advocate for, and this is for the game Abomination. Abomination has a, they call it pretty much the Prometheus variant. There's an Igor variant and a Prometheus variant, and the Prometheus variant is what was, was, was really created by the designer. So again, we have the designer's blessing to use this, and this is not only a house rule, this is a game-saving house rule or variant. The whole thing is you have to print a very small piece for Prometheus to put over the top of it. But this right here, I wrote down, it is a 30 to 40 percent shorter playtime. There's a new monster building process that kind of jumps a few levels. There's new dice mitigation. There's eight rounds instead of 12. It has just a very small print and play that you put over the top of it to change the game a bit. But this saves that game for me to the point to where this took it from a game we were going to get rid of to now we play it a lot. And every time I see anyone playing Abomination, I'm like, you know what? You've got to try the Prometheus variant. The Eager variant is great too. I prefer the Prometheus one. So if you do have Abomination, if you're looking at getting it, then I say try this. Again, try it the normal way. You're going to find probably it's too long. But this right here is honestly a reason to seek out the game Abomination because with this Prometheus variant, this is an incredible game. And I would love to see them make an official expansion pack for this, putting this in. Okay, my next one is kind of a fun one. And this one right here, I, I think I got the idea from uh, Joe from All Play. But um, this is, it's a very, it's a, it's a fun thing to add to one of my favorite games, and that is Raw. Raw is one of my top 10 or 20 games of all time. But the whole thing is with this is you can either pull that token and put it on the board, or you can invoke Raw. And that's funny because there's that tension on, is this guy going to invoke Raw or is he going to pull the token and keep the game moving forward? There's that fun tension. But to add to that tension, to take that Raw token and put it in there with the other tokens. So every turn begins the same with your hand reaching into the bag. And then all of a sudden, you're like, boom, I invoke Raw. I mean, that just for me adds a really fun element to the game. It barely qualifies as a house rule because it does not change the game at all, but it makes the game more fun for me. It adds that like, oh man, you, you know, you're waiting for that. It really adds to the tension of that moment. So if you do like Raw, try that. I think you'll like it. Okay, so my next one is, is for Dixit and Dixit style games. This is something that Dixit's really good. Um, I love it as a party game, but one, one house rule we've started having and it's become more and more prevalent and we really are fairly strict about it because it can really ruin a game. And that is we try to not use as many inside jokes, inside information things on Dixit. Like it can't be like, oh, that ice sculpture at our honeymoon or whatever. 
and it just gets odd because then you can go further, further down the rabbit hole. You start talking about someone you knew in middle school and all this. And for me, these games are more party atmosphere to get everyone involved. And that really add to people feeling left out. So for Dixit, we're really using more general information, things everybody would know. Now, I'm not talking movies and stuff. That's fine if you haven't seen those movies. But more inside baseball type thing, we have found kind of takes away from what we see as the strength of games like Dixit. So we don't really have inside information. We have everything that is pretty much common general knowledge. And, I mean, we do movies, but you've had the same chance to watch those terrible movies as I have. Just because I have and you haven't, doesn't mean I can't use them. So that's Dixit, house rule. Okay, so next is one of my favorite games of all time again, which is pretty funny. These are little tweaks because I think these house rules come out because you play a game so much, you find out little tweaks that make it work better for your group. And this is Betrayal of House on the Hill. Betrayal of House on the Hill is broken. Does the, do these little house rules that I have fix a broken game? They do not, because it is still broken at its core because the haunts could go one way or another. But the whole thing about this is a couple things I do. Number one, when, um, when the traitor or whatever betrayer is found, any player in the same room or an adjacent room gets a movement according to their speed. And that means you can kind of move away before the craziness begins. I just like this because I used to play um, paintball in college and we had this style of paintball. It's not just shoot, it's zombie paintball, right? So if you ever get shot by a paintball, by a zombie, you turn into a zombie and then you go after those people too. What I would hate is when I'm sitting there in a hole with somebody and the guy next to me gets shot and I look over, I'm like, oh man, and he just turns and shoots you from like four, four inches away. It's very frustrating. But that's pretty much about betrayal. You know, we kind of give someone a running head start. But that's also not the biggest one. The biggest one we do too is if someone becomes the traitor or the haunter or whatever, if they're the newer first time player, they get the option to opt out of that. They get the option just to ignore that role and to keep going and let someone else be the traitor or betrayer. And that helps for several reasons. Number one, it's sometimes uncomfortable for that person to all of a sudden, you feel like all the eyes are on you when you're starting to play this game. And then you have to be that person making those crunchy decisions. And during your first game, you're going to want to ask a lot of questions. And as the trader, asking those questions gets more difficult because you have to give out that inside information. So for us, it's not something we say you can't be the trader. We pretty much ask, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with it, you know, we'll keep going because I, I think that's something, a great way to offer it and make sure the gameplay moves forward. Because every time we'd have somebody as a trader that wasn't as good, no one really enjoyed the game, even that person that became the trader because they were so confused on that side. So anyway, that for us is what helps betrayer, betrayal at House on the Hill. Okay, so next we're going to talk about one of my wife's favorite games and one of my guilty pleasure games, and that is Smash Up. Smash Up's a great game because you get all these expansions and you mix two things together, like dinosaurs and princesses, and you play the dinosaur princesses. Or you have you go, go classic with shark and tornado, boom, sharknado. But the whole thing is picking factions. One of the things I do, and there's several different ways I do this, I've toyed with each one. One is the drafting of the factions. You're going to, if there's like, uh, you take it times two plus one. For example, a three-player game, you'd have a drafting of seven factions with one left over. So it's quicker to draft those. You can also write down all the factions you have and roll a die, a D20, D100, whatever, how many factions you have, and then choose it randomly that way. So those are two options to choose the factions. Now, one thing I do with bases, the actual rules for this are you get the bases, and it's the number of players plus one. Now, I don't play that way. I play, and this is just me, I play with either three bases or the bases match the player count. Why? Because that makes player interaction more prevalent. Because if you have too many bases out there, you're going to start getting bases to tip and there's very little player interaction. I want to kind of force those players to go back and forth at each other because I think that is where Smash Up has its strength is to see these minions go at it for different bases and see that battling on who is going to break that base and what points are out there. So that for me helps Smash Up a lot. So have that, that limit the number of bases you head out there. And also drafting will make it hit the table easier, at least it does for us. That's Smash Up. All right, this is my last one. I guess my number one, right? One that needs house rules. And honestly, when I thought of doing this thing on house rules, 
This is the one that is the most prevalent in my mind because this is probably one of the most house rule games that I own probably out there. And that is Zombie Side. Zombie Side is great because um, I think the company itself, they take all the Zombie Side house rules and they incorporate them into later iterations. Like, for example, when they first came out, there were so many house rules of people just ignoring stuff. Like, we are not going to shoot survivors first. Get over it. And we're also not going to do the split thing where instead of going around a corner, it used to be where if there's one zombie, then all of a sudden it splits to two and goes. It's like, what? No, we're ignoring that. But they actually incorporate those into later ones. Now, a couple things I do. Number one, obviously no splits and shooting the survivors. Then I like dual weapons. Now, again, this is gonna this is funny because zombie side is one of those people are like, whew, don't mess with my zombie side. These are things that work for me. All right. So don't get angry. You're still going through though. All right, for me, um, for me, like dual weapons, I think we make it to where if it's dual wield, you can dual wield any two weapons. You don't need two machetes, right? You can dual wield two weapons because honestly, in my mind, that just looks awesome. All right. So if they're dual wield, doesn't matter the dual the, which weapons they are, you can dual wield them. I love that. Also, there are no abominations until someone hits the first color the first movement up because I hate when the abomination shows up right off the bat. We just put him down there and then we reshuffle and ignore that it came out because that's more of an end of the movie type feeling you want to get than an abomination show up. It's very anticlimactic to have that big boy show up at the beginning and it just changes the entire tenure of the game. Something else is we play, depending on the scenario, that food can give you health. Now we've played with this a bit more where you can eat health for either, well, you need food for action points, or you can eat them for health, or you have to mix it with water and whatever. But that, I think, depending on the scenario, will actually help you a little bit along the way. But then another one I like is when you have rooms, you open up rooms, you don't get unlimited searches in rooms. You get a D3 in that room. What that means is you have a six, you roll a D6, and then you either, you normally will round it up or down. Um, I think we usually wrote, round it up and that's how many searches we have little treasure chests we put in those rooms so people can't just camp out in certain areas and keep searching rooms. You've got to kind of move them along. And then, so that's something we do that we do pretty much every type of zombie side. We just keep that going. And another one is if a player dies, then a player, another survivor is found behind a dumpster in a closet or whatever. And they keep playing from the bottom up. So no one is ever actually out of the game. So you actually, because that is very thematic that you're going to find someone hiding there next to some clothes and you're like, hey, you can help us. But of course, they're not armed and you have to then arm that person. And that person is starting again, but they're starting at a lower point because their experience is low, but it is what it is and they're still playing. So those are some for zombies. I've got a lot more, but those are the ones I probably will get yelled at the least. Okay. Oh, man. That felt like something good to get off my chest. I'm just glad I had this nice little therapy session with you. Those are those six games that I house rule. Six out of a lot of the ones that I house rule. So this is one that I want you guys to put your comments. If there are any other house rules you have on those games, put them below. But also any other house rules that you have for games that for you have helped that experience. Because that's what it all is about is playing a game and having a great experience. So some of your favorite house rules, put those in the comments. I love to read them because I'm always looking for other reasons to get these games to the table and to try something new. Because honestly, I know for a fact a lot of these designers play these games and look at some of those rules and think, it's a good idea. And you use, you, sometimes you see those in later iterations. So anyway, comment down there, tell me your favorite house rules. And that is it. So I will see you later on the channel. I'm Joy Evans. Hey folks, thanks for joining us for that video. If you haven't yet, like the video, subscribe to the channel, and hey, make sure you check out what's happening where I'll cover an app on an iOS or a Switch device, and you can check it out along with me. Thanks very much. You've been watching The Dice Tower.